I'm going to take about um, probably 45 minutes to uh, give you an introduction to an uh, enzyme called DNAs1. Uh, who knows what DNAs1 does? Okay. So it's a big part of the ENCODE project, actually. Um, it's, um, so let me just start by saying that this is uh, what I'll be showing you is some recent results from from my lab in close collaboration with uh, one of the key DNAs people in the ENCODE project, John Stamm, uh, and also Remo Rose, who's a structural biologist. Um, this was done by a um, PhD student in my lab, Alan Lazarevich, and also Todd was involved, and a bunch of people from these other labs. Um, but the DNAs1 is an, is an enzyme, and I'll show a crystal structure of how it interacts with DNA a little later on. Um, it's an endonuclease. So it's a nuclease, it means it can chew up nucleotides, like DNA, right? Uh, it's an endonuclease, so it can start chewing in the middle of a B4 DNA molecule, not just from the ends, right? Um, and it hydrolyzes the DNA backbone. So what that means is that, you know, if you have a phosphate and then a, like a sugar, I hope I'm drawing that right, and then uh, another phosphate, right? Um, and another sugar, the backbone, it will get rid of one of these phosphate groups. And basically, it will cleave a, a single strand of DNA. Of course, this is part of a, a nucleotide that also has bases that pair with other bases, another backbone over here, right? But DNAs1, at least the way it's used in, you know, in, in genomics, uh, mostly is cutting DNA in a single-stranded fashion. It creates what are called NICs, like these little pieces eaten out of the backbone on one end of the DNA when, when the DNA is exposed to it. Um, there, it's a gene, right? It's an, actually, the enzyme that's used uh, is bovine DNAs. Um, probably has, has some nice properties compared to, say, human. Or, uh, but um, it's not really, uh, not a lot of people are worried about what its endogenous function is in the cell, right? It's mostly used as a lab reagent, like, like polymerase or, or, or TAC, right? It's used to, to, to get rid of DNA. In, you know, if you have it at a high concentration, you can remove DNA from your sample if you don't want it, right? But if you lose, use it at a lower concentration, it will, you know, the, the density of these NICs in the DNA molecules is something like, it could be one per kb or less, right? So, um, and that, this is how it's used uh, when people are performing what, what's called footprinting uh, of chromatin or of protein DNA complexes, right? And that's the really the, the, the real lab application of this uh, enzyme. This shows um, kind of classic application of, uh, of DNAs1 for footprinting. What you see here is a comparison between two experiments. Um, on the left, there's just naked DNA, right? And on the right, there's naked DNA incubated with some purified protein in this case. So it's a bit like Todd's lecture, you know, he was showing uh, select seek and, and related methods, how they work. It would be a similar kind of setup here. Uh, at least the first step, right, would be to incubate b form DNA. Uh, but in case, this is all the same DNA sequence, not a mixture of different sequences like Todd had, right, um, here. And what, what this green dot is, is some end label of the DNA. It could be a fluorescent label, or it could be a, a radioactive label in the old days, right? Um, and then if this label is what you see in the gel when you run this, this DNA molecule in a gel, um, what you'll see is the, the, the end label, the fluorescent or the radioactive end label. Right? Um, now, if you wouldn't treat this DNA, uh, so the na naked DNA on the left, with DNAs1, um, you would see only a single band, and that's you know, the longest, uh, the slowest moving molecule, right? So it would be on the top of the gel. You would see a single band for the full length DNA molecule. Now, when you treat with DNAs1, DNAs will create these NICs, right? And um, what you're running on the gel is actually DNA after denaturation, uh, right? So it's single stranded DNA. Even though the cut was made in the context of a B form double stranded DNA molecule, uh, what you'll be running on the gel is a single. Uh, Stranded and, and only one of the strands is end labeled, so it's the only one that you'll see on the gel. It's only one of the strands being visualized. 
Now, depending on where the cut by DNA is, right, is relative to this labeled end, the length of the fragment that contains the, the, the fluorescent or, or radioactive label will vary. Right? If the cut was made close to the end that was labeled, often the 3 pi end for, for reactive laser, um, it's a short fragment. It will be at the bottom of the gel, see over here. And if the, the nick was made close to the end, the, the unlabeled end of the DNA, it will be close to full length. It will be a bend, right? And there's only a discrete number of positions where this cut can be made. That's every base pair, right? And um, that means you see a discrete pattern in the gel corresponding to just the the length of the DNA in, in terms of the number of nucleotides, right? Um, and you get this ladder. And if, if you just take naked DNA and you cut it with DNAs 1, uh, you'll see a, well, here it's drawn as a uniform ladder. Now, in a way, what I'll be talking about is whether this is, whether the intensity of every band is the same or not, right? It's, uh, um, it turns out that there are thousand-fold variation in the rate of which DNA cuts at different positions, depending on the, and people are not so aware of, of this, actually. You know, we, we basically quantified this for the first time um, in, in this paper. And, you know, you have to worry then about, you know, interpretation of these kind of data where you have a protein or a chromatin with more uh, proteins and nucleosomes and all that. Okay, but th that's looking ahead. Right? Let's, this is just what the ladder looks like for naked DNA. This is what, um, if you have the protein present, right, what is the effect of the protein? What do you think that the protein will enhance the cleavage by DNAs 1 if there's a protein sitting on the B-formed DNA? Do you think it will be easier for DNAs 1 to cut there? No, right. Although sometimes it may be easier if, you know, if the protein deforms the DNA. But that's, but the, the first order, it will prevent DNAs from cutting, right? So if you have this protein sitting over some range of base pairs on this double-stranded DNA, DNAs cannot get in, then after you expose this protein DNA complex to DNAs and then you get rid of the protein and you denature the DNA and you run the end labeled DNA on the gel, you'll get a gap here in this bending pattern that you would have seen for naked DNA exactly where those are the phosphate positions that were blocked from cleavage by DNA. Right? That's the footprint of the protein on the DNA that you're seeing in this ladder. Now, this is you know, classic uh, footprinting with gels and end labeled DNA. Uh, and, of course, um, people have been you now uh, trying to do this with high throughput sequencing. And, again, John Stamm's lab, but also Greg Crawford and, and other people have, have pioneered this. Um, um, and first, with tiling arrays, so you can you know, put these fragments on genomic tiling arrays. But now, these days, everybody uses uh, Lumina sequencing or other high throughput sequencing to do this. Right? And so the way this works is a little different it's a little more complicated than what I just sketched with the, you know, the gel-based method. Um, if you have, if this is double-stranded DNA, right, so I have the five fragment, and I'm not showing the helix here, but of course this would be a helical piece of B-form DNA. Three pri five prime to three prime, and then five prime to three prime on the other strand, right? Um, what you sequence are fragments created by actually four nicks of by DNAs one. So you get a first cut here, say, and let's say that the scale here of base pairs is something like this. And there's a lot of base pairs in between as well. So I get a cut here between two base pairs. Maybe I'll get a cut just one base pair over on the other strand, right? And then I get a similar pair of cuts. Maybe here it happens to be on opposite sides, you know, between the same two base pairs. Right? What this does, it will free, take, you know, you create this double-stranded DNA molecule, maybe with a bit of a three prime overhang or a five prime overhang on, on either side, right? Um, and then this will it is no longer covalently attached to the rest of the of the chromosome, right? So it can come out. So you can produce these fragments and typical size of these fragments, and actually there's a size selection step part of this protocol, about 200 base pairs long. And then once you get this fragment out, you can actually repair the three prime ends, you know, either you make them longer or shorter, so that you get blunt ends on, on both sides, and then you can ligate them to sequencing adapters. And then you'll, if you do single end sequencing, right, you'll either sequence um, 
it's always the five prime end, right? You're always sequencing from five prime to three prime. It could be sequencing over here from the five prime end of this fragment, or you know, with similar probability, sequence from this five prime end, right? Just to this side of, the, of where the cut was made on the bottom strand. And you know, this clean out enzyme that's it's used to repair the overhang, right? It doesn't move the five prime end. It only makes the three prime end consistent with the five prime. End. So you don't lose the single base pair resolution of where the cut was made on the five prime. And then, but then the way we're going to interpret the data is that whenever we, so now, okay, you, you have this, right, so you have this fragment of DNA and you, you, you ligate adapters to it on both sides, and then you sequence, right, one of these ends. Right? Now, how do you reconstruct where what was the cut event corresponding to this sequencing read, right? Is you will take this read, which is say 30 or 50 base pair long sequence, right? Map it back to the genome that whose, whose you know, chromosomes you were digesting. And then where, see the phosphate just five prime of where the first match to this read is in the genome. That was where the cut was. The cut was made between two base pairs, two nucleotides. It was actually the two nucleotides on the strand that the read Response to. Right. Okay, so this is ignoring some of these subtleties of you know that you, you need multi, you know additional cuts about 200 base pairs, three prime of where your read maps right. You also you need a cut somewhere you know of a range of maybe five base pairs, uh, you know three prime or five prime on the other strand. But the hope is that that kind of washes out right. That, that it doesn't really matter so much. That it averages out. Any kind of sequence dependence of that. Right? But you do have single base pair resolution of the position where, um, where, where one of the four cuts was made that to release one of these fragments from the, the, the chromosome molecule. Make sense? Um, okay. So we just have a lot of cuts across the genome. Of course, when we do an experiment like this, um, it's not just one cell or one, one genome, right? It's lots of cells, lots of genomes. Right, then what we'll see is an accumulation of cut events, you know, the positions of the, the five prime ends of these mapped reads, right, from our Illumina uh, uh, FASQ file, um, that are um, uh, read in some kind of average pattern. Um, and this is what it looks like in reality. This is from a paper, the first uh, application of, the, you know, high throughput sequencing with this DNA footprinting uh, uh, by John Stamm's lab, where they did this in yeast cells. Uh, and this is a hierarchy of, of spatial scales. You know, on top you see one full or big chunk of a, of a chromosome, right? So this profile where the peaks are, those are regions where you get many more cuts than average, right? In the surrounding regions. Um, now, classically, at the course of resolution, DNAs1 has been used, and this is still a big application, to, to find the active regions of the genome, right? The idea is that if a promoter or enhancer is active, there's a lot of exchange of proteins, maybe there's fewer nucleosomes there, and by some mechanism, DNAs has an easier time cutting DNA at those regions than you know, elsewhere in the genome. So, and those are called DNAs hypersensitive regions. They're on a scale of say one AB, right? And in those regions compared to surrounding regions, you get more cleavage by DNA, right? And so it's a way of finding where the active non-coding parts of the genome are, in a particular cell type, so it's highly cell type specific, like RNA expression profiling and even chip, right? Um, and maybe it's not completely inaccurate to think about any kind of human cell you know, of a specific cell type as as a yeast cell kind of cell, but then you know, uh, but but there's lots of parts of the of the genome that are just not being used; they're packed up in this inactive part. Right? But if you add up the length of all the DNA is hypersensitive active regions. It's about a similar um, total amount of, of uh, sequence. Right? Now, this is a coarse grained way of, of doing this, where this picture over here, this, this uh, hypersensitivity profile. Right? But now you can zoom in, and these boxes here are genes. Right? So now we're looking at the scale of genes. You see that in between these genes, there's more cleavage by DNA than in the genes themselves. And actually, well, in, we have a lab that's a little more open-ended than what we've had before, um, is, is to 
to compute some kind of aggregate um, DNA profile. We'll actually use these data uh, from this paper, uh, plot the aggregate profile of DNA cleavage relative to the start site genes, right across all the genes to see this, this general pattern. You can actually see oscillations in a hypersensitivity corresponding to the positioning, the regular positioning of the nucleosomes uh, in the data. Well, if you do this, you know, if there's subsets of genes that have different types of patterns, but if you do that, and in this paper there's a figure that shows that. Um, okay, now, so now we're zooming in on the scale of, say, 1 kb. This is 2.5 kb, this arrow in here, right? Uh, but we can zoom in even further. We can zoom in to the, to the level of individual binding sites, right? So now this red box is, you know, about 10, 12 base pair region, right? And this is the actual genome sequence. And this is the binding site for tricyclopeptide RAP1, right? And you see there's a local depletion or footprint, for, you know, caused by the presence of this RAP1 protein in complex with, with the genomic DNA, right? So, so the hope is that you can, you know, now that we have this one base pair resolution DNA's profile, right? That if the coverage is high enough across the genome, then we can hope to uh, to map these footprints. And this is again what, what people are doing this with the in vivo uh, DNAs1 data. Now, there's something that helps you here in terms of the coverage of the genome. If you, if you think of uh, methylome sequencing, for instance, right, so you, you have bisulfide sequencing and then you, uh, uh, you, you're trying to determine whether your, 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 your C was methylated or not, right, what you do is you purify the naked DNA from the cells and then you resequence it. So now you have all your reads kind of get spread uniformly across the genome, um, and you need a lot of sequencing. You basically have to resequence the genome to, to map all the methylated CPGs, right? Uh, for DNAs1, it's a little better because not all of the genome is it's flat, right? The reads are not spread uniformly across the genome. There's these specific subregions of the genome that are DNAs hypersensitive. They have much more, you know, they're more open. You have more cleavage locally by. DNA1. So there, locally within the interesting hypersensitive region, you have a, effectively a much higher read coverage, you know, density of cuts per base pair per, per, per KB than, than, you know, on average across the genome. So that helps in finding these footprints, right? This is, this is within a region that has more cuts per, say, KB than average in the genome, right? But within that region that has an enhanced uh, density of reads, there are then relative to that local enhanced level, there are the local depletions of, uh, that correspond to the footprints of, of trashypnosis. So, about three years ago, uh, we, uh, we were interested in you know, analyzing these data and maybe inferring motifs from them and modeling all the complex cooperative uh, interactions between trashypnosis factors and nucleosomes based on these data. And then we thought, you know, before we do that, we should make sure we have a good null model of how DNAs acts on naked DNA, right? Um, and basically, it took us three years to just figure that out. And <laughs> we haven't gone anywhere with it in vivo. We're now working on that. But, um, and we found some very surprising uh, things, including what we think is a new general mechanism by which uh, DNA methylation influences protein DNA interaction. It doesn't only apply to DNA1, but more generally. This is a big open question, right, how you see changes in methylation and there's corresponding changes in gene expression, right, but it, there's not a lot of n uh, detailed understanding of the mechanism that connects the changes in methylation to the changes in, in gene expression. And, and we think we have at least one mechanism by which that could actually explain this connection based on trying to characterize DNA as one. So I guess um, the Maniaris, the manual, actually famous, from Cold Spring Harbor Press, right? Um, it's now on uh, edition four, I think, but um, this is from edition three, um, and this is the, one of the appendices on DNAs1. They have, you know, for important enzymes that are used in the lab, they have like one or two pages of detailed information. So here you actually see some figure that shows where, where the NICs are made, right, in the DNA molecule. Uh, actually, how it works is depends on whether you have like manganese or magnesium in your buffer. And, um, Right, that's kind of detail. And then they say, whether this nicking activity of DNAs1 displays sequence specificity remains a surprisingly murky topic with conflicting data from several groups. There are like two, about 15-year-old papers where, uh, where the authors 
digested a, about 150 base pair piece of end labeled DNA you know, along the lines of this gel that I showed, right? Um, and they tried to build a weight matrix from it. Actually, it was a, there's actually a, a weight matrix in the paper from about 15 years ago for DNA is one, but then there was another paper that was like totally inconsistent with it, and the correlation between their predictions of naked DNA cleavage rate was was essentially zero, right? So, so people, you know, they don't really, they kind of ignored this, um, uh, this, you know, uh, in, in, the, in the literature. Right? In the Hesselberg paper, there was a null model, but it was only looking at one base upstream and uh, you know the, the two base pairs surrounding the cut, and it was assuming <coughs> that the that the, the relative cut rates had the reverse complement symmetry, right? And we didn't like that assumption because um, uh, the way DNA sees the locally the one strand of the DNA is very strand specific, right? I mean, going from five prime to three prime in the nucleotide sequences, right? On one strand because it's cutting. It, unlike DNA binding proteins, I said, you know, you cannot really think about a triplet vector as binding to one strand or another strand, right? It's binding to the major groove or the minor groove. Uh, but DNA is one is different. It cuts one of the strands, not the other strand, right? So there, this reverse complement symmetry is not something that you want to assume a priori. Now, there was another reason why we, as a lab that you know worries about quantitative modeling of protein DNA interaction, we we liked uh, this naked DNA, right? So now I have to be clear. This was the in vivo data. What you do is you isolate nuclei from cells, right? And then you treat those nuclei with DNAs. One, um, and then, so the cuts are made in the presence of the chromatin. There's no cross-linking, but there's, you know, you try to keep these nuclei intact as much as possible and then get the DNAs in there uh, and, you know, cut the DNA where it's accessible, right? But part of this study, uh, John's lab um, did an experiment where they just purified DNA from yeast cells so naked DNA, no, all the, the, the cell and the proteins are all gone, right? And then get the same kind of data on that naked DNA. And that's the data that we were analyzing. And in, in that data, you know, it's, it's great because it's, these, are, these cut events tell you in every case that there was a DNA protein sitting there, right, at that spot on the genome. And that single base pair resolution, we, were, we know exactly where the binding occurred, right? Unlike in the case with, say, PBM or Celex, like Todd was talking about, where in those random sequences in Celex or the, the probes on the PBM array, the, the actual binding site could be anywhere and any offset within that molecule, right? So it was harder to uh, get to deconvolve this, uh, and, it's, and you get biases because of this, right? And so uh, this don't have any of those worries, right? It's very nice uh, data. Um, okay, and so we were trying to analyze the, the sequence preferences based on this. So, so we have a big table basically of just every line is one cut event. It has the chromosome. It tells you between which two base pairs the cut was made, right? And then ideally on what <coughs> strand. Um, and then you can make tables. You can, for instance, say, okay, let me, and now here minus three to plus three shows nucleotide positions relative to where the cut was made. So if, you know, the cut was here, this is the minus one nucleotide, right, at the base, and this is the plus one, and then there's minus two, et cetera. Right, so on the, you know, towards the three prime end of the strand that was cut, you have the positive positions, and then towards the five prime end, you have the negative. Right, so the cut was made between minus one and plus one. So these four numbers add up to the total number of cuts that were made, right? But then we were pigeonholing them according to the surrounding, uh, the, the, the base identity of the, 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 the minus one uh, nucleotide. So this base, minus one, is not part of the read, right? So plus one, because the read goes from, you know, right at the cut and then towards the three prime end, this would be the first base in the read, right? This would be the second base in the read, etc. cetera. Uh, but to get this one, minus one, minus two, we need to map the read to the genome, right? And then from the genomic context, we look up what the base identities are. But that's that's easy. Right. You have to worry about problems with mappability, like is the case with chip data, and that's, we'll also deal with that in the in the lab. Right. But so I get more cuts, you know, with a T or a an A immediately five prime of, of the of the cut 
than a C or a G, right? Now, does that tell me that DNA prefers to cut, you know, DNA uh, just uh, three prime of, a, of an A or a T? Well, not necessarily, right? Because you have to control for the genomic composition, right? Um, if you make a cut randomly somewhere in the genome, right, um, then there are biases. The yeast genome, for instance, is more AT than GC rich, right? So this shows actually the total number of of all the mappable positions in the genome. How often do you find an A at minus one or a T C or G? You see, these numbers are not uniform, right? And so to control for this in a weight matrix type model, what we would do is we would take this number and divide by this number, right? And then if we do that for C and for G and for T, we get four ratios, right? And those are then, uh, the ratios between those ratios of observed and you know, genomic positions tell us something about the preferences of the DNA right? So you take the largest ratio and use that to normalize everything, and then you get a, uh, uh, what we could call a position-specific cut rate. No, and it's one for yeah, so the most favorable nucleotide position, and then this is the relative cut rate associated with a mutation from that most cleavable genomic context to something else. So, for instance, if you go from a T to an A, you get about 60% of the cleavage effectivity, et cetera. Right. Now, okay, this is nice. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, we, we decided to look at this hexamer just, you know, because you have to, that's where most of the action is, but it's definitely more, uh, more, it's beyond just the hexamer window, right, it extends to it. That's, maybe partly because of this phenomenon of this, right, this other cut, right, and that might also depend on sequence function. Yeah, but we decided to not, you know, we, we could, right, I mean, in the ideal world, we would have spent <laughs> another year or two. <laughs> really figure it out. So, so um, okay, so what Mark was just saying is that um, most of the action is, is here, you know, from minus three to plus three. There, there are dependencies outside of the region, but let's, let's assume that, you know, DNA one cares about the hexamer centered at where the cut was made, right? And on this P, I'm showing one of the phosphate. Of course, there's a phosphate between any, you know, two adjacent nucleotides. But that's the one that was removed by DNA one, so that's why I'm showing it right, in the top uh, line. Okay, so we have this high throughput sequencing data, um, and we could make a table, you know, of, of relative cleavage rate for every hexamer rather than use this independence assumption and constructing this weight matrix. Right, we're in a luxury situation; we don't to make we don't need to make any assumptions about uh, about independence. We can just uh, do the following: we could now make a table that doesn't have four rows, A, C, G, or T, and then positions. We could just, you know, whenever there's a cut, we could look up the hexamer context of that cut, right? And then see how many cuts do we fall, you know, in this hexamer context, the 7,100, right? And how many mappable genomic positions are there that would have this hexamer context at 3588, right? So you take the ratio of these two numbers, right? You get something close to two. Of course, these, this, Skills with the size of your library, right? If your library is twice, if you have twice as many reads, these counts on average will be twice as large, right? So this ratio is not really meaningful by itself, right? And then it's only the ratios between different rows, between different hexamer contexts of this thing that matter, right? This tells you that these two hexamer contexts are similarly cleavable. It doesn't tell you, the 1.6 doesn't really mean, it would have been 3.2 if we had twice the size. So what we do is just scale by the largest number, again, like with the cell you know, it's kind of analog analogous, right? Um, uh, we, we scale by that ratio, and then for every hexamer, we get a, a cut rate, relative cut rate, from zero to one. Okay, now here it shows the distribution, of course, as an ECDF, not as a histogram, right? Because we're, we know how to read cumulative distributions, right? Uh, and, uh, 
until we submit a manuscript to a high profile journal where then we're converting it to a histogram, but only then, right? Uh, in the meantime, we want to get as much possible information. So, so this is, this is a, this curve, right? Um, so what does the distribution look like? Right, how do you convert this to just a histogram-like thing, right? When you look at this curve. What I've done here, I've ranked all the hexamers by their relative cut rate, right? So rank one, in this case, is like the, the least cleavable hexamer. And then, the, you know, 4096 is, is the most cleavable hexamer that has a, a cut rate by construction equal to one, right? And this shows that as you, and this, this shows, you know, on a log scale, 10 to minus three, 10 to minus two, 10 to minus one, and one, the relative cut rate. And so, it, as I move my cut rate value, right, the number of tick marks, say, right, on these are, there are 4,096 tick marks on this axis. And this curve shows how many of those tick marks are to the left of my current x value, right? That's how you read the sequence. Right, so you get the first, I move here, I tick, tick, tick. If I move uniformly, right? So the highest density of tick marks is in the middle, right? Because that's where the line is steepest. And that's why the distribution looks like a Gaussian. It's the derivative of this cumulative distribution function that corresponds, to, that's what the histogram you know, would look like. Okay, but you don't need bins here. That's, so you can still mentally, you can always like, differentiate. So, so the, but the message here is that there's like a thousand fold variation in cleavage rate, right? From on the order of 10 to minus three to order one, right? So between the most cleavable, least cleavable hexamer context, there's about a thousand fold difference, which, you know, would come as a surprise. I mean, you know, whenever I tell people about this, who work on the DNA's one or are familiar with it, I say, you know, what do you think is the ratio between the highest, most cleavable, right? And people say, uh, five fold or maybe ten fold, or <laughs> right? And then a thousand fold, that's the surprise. Okay, so this, this shows um, a comparison between two replicates of the same experiment, naked DNA digested with DNAs one. Um, um, and in this case, we just constructed this hexamer table from the first replicate and then constructed the hexamer table from the second replicate, right? And the points are on a nice straight line. The R squared is about 98%. Um, and, um, you know, the, the error is kind of consistent with, with the square root of the counts that we have, right? Of course, it's based um, you know, if you go back to this table, and after yesterday's tutorial, you, you you would know how to deal with this, right? This, right, 7100, right? That's plus or minus the, right? This is really the frequency, you know, the, 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 the rate at which you would cut in this hexamer context times the size of the library, right? So there's some real expected number of cuts that you would expect if you do the experiment many, many times, but then you will you know, get as a result that actual, you know, real average lambda, the lambda from the Poisson distribution, plus or minus the square root of that 7100, right? So on the order of plus or minus 100. So the relative error in the estimation of this cleavage rate is something like one over the square root of 10,000 is about 1%, right? One over 100. So that's, that's the same. The, the deviation from R squared of 100% is, is consistent. But now, what I show here on the left is that I use one of the replicates, to, again, the same way to compute, construct a hexamer table, but then for the other replicate, I did not build a hexamer table. I was building this weight matrix-like thing, position. I was assuming independence between the positions, right, relative to the cut, and trying to see how well my weight matrix uh, independence assumption prediction compared with the actual cleavage rate. And you see here, it's much more scattered, right? So by ignoring the dependencies between the nucleotide positions, we're losing information uh, about what DNA is doing. And now, this plot is a, is a little more complicated, but it's, it's, I think it's not too hard to understand. What, what I'm doing here is uh, showing what is the effect of a point mutation at some relative position, you know, on the cleavage rate, but then in shown in different contexts of the rest of the hexamer. So here, this is where the cut was made. Here, there's a T at position minus one, right? 
And then here, I've mutated that T to a G. Right? So I go from G to T. Um, so it's related to here the minus one column and what you know the full of the factors of going from T to G, right? Which will reduce the cut rate to about you know 30 percent of the of the of the optimal cut rate, right? So go back to this figure, right? If you start from say the optimal hexamer, right? This point over here, every point here is a hexamer. It's really a pair of hexamers that, that, are, that either have a T or a G at position minus one, right? But the rest of the hexamer is the same. So if I go make this mutation, right, the Y value after this mutation is about 0.3 times the original like, X value, right? And of course, you know, if Y over X is some ratio, the points are on the line. So if this independence assumption holds, then the effect of this point mutation would be to reduce the cut rate by a third, um, uh, or to, to like 30 percent of its value, regardless of what the other bases are. Now, of course, you know if you have something really bad at one or more of these end positions, right? You'll be closer to the origin, right? You start from something not so great, and you make it even worse, right? Um, right? And, and again, for the optimal bases here, you'll be at the end of this line. Well, you, s you have exactly one, the optimal cleavage rate with the T and then you go to something else. Right? So the fact that these points are on the line tells us that the independence is assumption is OK for a mutation from T to G at position uh, minus 1. But it's not always the case. This, this shows just for some other position, now the plus 2 position, where we're going from an A to a C. Right? And, um, you see that these points are no longer on the line. So now the fold effect of this mutation, right, the cleavage rate after mutation, so when you have a C, divided by the cleavage rate uh, when you have an A, or Y over X, which is the, you know, the slope of the line connecting the origin and that point, right, that is not the same for all these hexamer contexts. Right? And so it means it matters what, you know, what at least some of these other bases are. Now, if you look at this, you look at the actual sequence of those points uh, on the scatter plot. It didn't take us long to find out what's going on here, um, because all these points on the lower diagonal had a T at the adjacent position plus one, right? So, if you have a T at position plus one, you're sensitive to the mutation from A to C. Right? But if you have something else, A, C, or G. You're on a line that has a slope of one. This is actually, you know, a dash line is a line with a slope of one. So, so you don't feel this mutation, right? So, this is a very, you know, explicit way of showing the dependencies between the nucleotide positions. It basically shows as multiple diagonals in these kind of plots. So, for the mutation, you can pick any position, and then how many possible pairs of bases are there, right, for a given mutated position. Like here I'm going from A to C, right, but there's other possibilities as well. Yeah, or how many, yeah, how many, how many, how many ways could have chosen these two axes, you know, for position plus two? Well, you, you start from any base, right? So that's four, right? And now you pick the other base. How many possibilities? Three. Right. So it's four times three, 12 possibilities? Yeah, in a way. But, but then if you go from A to C or from C to A, it's basically the same plot, right? So you divide by two. So it's four, choose two, is six. You could say, you know, A and C, that's one of the, these doubly degenerate IUPAC signals, and we're six of those, right? Same kind of thing. Okay, so now you've also seen that um, this relative affinity, you can think of it as the difference between the delta delta G, you know, of a protein DNA interaction for the first sequence that you're coming from, and then the, del the delta G, the delta is one delta, it's a difference between bound and unbound state, right? Um, delta delta G, if you see this, uh, it means the difference between two delta Gs, right? It's related to the difference in binding affinity to two different sequences. Right? And so you can think of this full change in affinity as 
the Boltzmann factor e to the delta delta g, you know, associated with this point mutation divided by uh, rt. Now, this figure shows basically all possible ways of picking the mutation that you do, right? Whether you do it at minus one or minus two, minus three, and then within a given position, there's these six possible ways of choosing a mutation, A to C, A to G, A to T, C to D, C to T, G to T, right? Um, and then we're looking at these two diagonals, <coughs> or at least looking at the difference in the slope depending on some context base, right? Um, if there's no dependence on context, if we have true independence, this is what it looks like, right? It doesn't depend, of course, on what's going on at the other five positions, right? Uh, and, 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 and it's just the full change in the cut rate due to the mutation, right? So, so both of these are delta delta g's, basically, right? The change in free energy with associated with the point mutation, but this one is where we're actually explicitly looking at the dependence of some other position in the binding set, and here we're assuming independence. So what's really interesting is to look at the difference between these two matrices, right? The delta delta g is conditional and then we subtract the one on the right, right? So then we get delta, delta, delta G, <laughs> right? And that, that shows you now the size of the dependencies. It's, again, it's related to Todd's you know, dependencies uh, we talked about yesterday, right? right? What, what you see here is that if you compute the p-value for the influence of some, you know, other position within the hexamer on the, what's going on at, at the mutated position, it's actually statistically significant throughout the binding site. So even what you have at minus three influences, you know, what the effect of mutations at plus three. It's more an illustration of that you have to be careful interpreting p-values as effect sites, right, than say that there's something interesting going on here, because all the action is mostly at the, between neighboring nucleotide positions, right? Here, in terms of effect size, there's very little going on, right? So it's just that if your sample is large enough, even a small effect size will become statistically significant. It's just a function of having so many reads, you know, uh, in our data. But it doesn't mean that you, you know, you're too excited about those far away connections. But it was very interesting to us that there were these strong dependencies between neighboring positions. And if you know a little bit about um, DNA shape and you know and stacking between base pairs, actually this would ring a bell that maybe there's something about the structure of DNA that's driving the variation in the cut rate in the sequence, right, rather than the primary sequence itself, um, right? And so we, we started to collaborate with, with Remo Rose, um, who can do the following. He can take a piece of DNA, B-form DNA, maybe 15 base pair DNA molecule, and simulate, do a full atom simulation in a computer simulator, in a, in a, on a supercomputer, where it's sort of wiggling around, you know, using some kind of energy potential, right? And then he can predict the average shape of this DNA molecule. Now it turns that not, not every B-form DNA molecule is the same, right? The, the width of the ma major and the minor group, the geometry, with all these things like angles between subsequent base pairs, that they, of course, they fluctuate, but they fluctuate around different values depending on the sequence of the DNA, right? So there's a, there's a a lot of serious variation in the shape of the DNA backbone uh, with, with sequence, right? And that influences protein-DNA interaction. And, you know, recently, uh, partly through to, you know, uh, all their efforts, and also Remo and Barry Honig, uh, his former postdoc mentor, they've shown that this is really, for nucleosomes, it's very important in these minor groove interactions and the variation of the minor groove. P53, right? Uh, like, it's, it seems lots of superfactors actually recognized the minor group as well as the matrix. It's just been ignored for a long time, right? People have focused on these alpha helices going into the major group of DNA, but there are serious, uh, no, let's say up to like tenfold contributions in, in, the, in the affinity from, from these minor group interactions. Right? So what we did is we, we collaborated with them and to, on, on by, to see if maybe what DNA's one is sensing and, and what drives this thousand-fold variation in cut rate, you know, depending on where you cut in the, in the genome, is not so much the, the, the base sequence itself and hydrogen bonding uh, with, with base uh, pairs, for instance, but it's through the variation of the shape of the, of the DNA. And pretty much what we found here is you see a crystal structure of DNAs sitting on the DNA. And where it cuts the DNA, it's over here, where this arrow is, the backbone here, 
is disrupted because of this nick that, that I drew earlier. Right? And then here you see the these are the bases attached to the strand that was cut, and then these are the pairing bases on the other strand of the DNA molecule. I'm just color coding these base pairs here um, to show their relative position. These are the minus three and the minus two position. And this is where almost the only interaction between the protein and the DNA occurs. It's where a couple of charged uh, amino acids, arginines, uh, and a tyrosine that's stacking with the sugar ring, but it's mostly these charged arginines that have a positive charge, right? Uh, interact with the DNA. Really, what the reason why they like to interact here is that <coughs> the phosphates on the backbone are negatively charged, right? And so it's electro electrostatic interaction between these positive side chains and the negative phosphates on the DNA. When those, when the minor groove is more narrow, right? Then here the interaction is in the minor groove rather than in the major groove, right? It's not here in this major groove where these alpha helices would go. It's an oh, sorry over here. <laughs> it's in the, on the minor group. Um, so this electrostatic interaction in the minor group is stronger between the arginines and the backbone phosphate when, when the minor group is more narrow. Maybe it also has to do with water molecules and all that, but you know, it doesn't really matter exactly what the mechanism is or a combination of mechanisms, but the more narrow minor group has a more favorable interaction with, with these arginines. And you see this here in these scatter plots. Um, Right, this shows the minor groove width from the computer simulations of the free DNA molecule, right, from three angstrom to about six angstrom, and then this is the log of the cut rate, so it's the delta delta G, right, um, zero delta delta G means the optimal, most cleavable sequence, right, and then if the energy is higher, it's less favorable, right. In physics, the higher energy is bad, right, so the lowest energy is the most favorable state, right. So you go from the most cleavable to the less cleavable, right? And um, this thousand-fold range in cut rates that we saw is along this axis. <coughs> and there's a, there's a significant correlation between the minor group width and the delta delta G, and it's positive. That means that a more narrow minor group is more favorable, right? Has a lower delta delta G. Um, actually, I want to make a general point about binning scatter plots that has nothing to do with DNA as one. But it's, it's done in the literature, and I think it's good to be aware that we're, it's naughty to do this. Um, uh, so, let's see. You see those bins there, right? The blue bins? So, there are bo it's, it's basically a box plot with multiple bins, right? And the box gives you a sense of the spread of the values on the delta delta g axis within each slice of the x values, right? Um, and you know, because are you showing these boxes, you you know that there's actually even right for a minor groove uh, width of say by four, right? Over here, there's been you still have a whole range of cut rates. It's not like a minor groove width that's very precisely predictive of of the cut rate, right? So you wouldn't explain you know, anywhere close to 100% of the variance of the delta delta Gs f in terms of the minor groove width, right? Of course, it's very significant, but it's not like the R squared is, a, is 100. Now, if I would ma have made a plot similar to those boxes that looks like this, I'll switch uh, markers. So it's just the same axis, minor groove width, versus delta delta G. Right. If I would have made a plot where I've just shown a mean of every each of these boxes, right? So within this slice of minor group widths, there's some value here of the mean, and then there's another value of the mean, etc. Right. And I would draw a straight line, and I would compute the R squared over those 10 or so points, right? I get a fantastic R squared of that, maybe 90 percent or something. But the underlying data, and then maybe you know, I want to show the uh, the uh, that there's variation. So I compute the standard error of the mean of you know all the points falling in this range, right? Which has this one over square root of n, right? It's not the standard deviation, which is the width of these boxes. But maybe I'll put that height of the box, but it's like divided by the square root of the number of points in that bin, right? Standard error of the mean. Right? Uh, but the r squared of this is great, 90%. 
Um, but of course, the underlying data is that we had these 4,096 hexamers, right, with points that are pretty much all over the place, right? Where this is, you know, so the R squared, and we fit on the original data, the 4,096 points could be 0.03, for instance. Still a great R squared <laughs> compared to 4,096, right? But not, uh, not, you know, this makes clear that it's not, minor group width is not explaining by far all the variance in the delta delta. So this is important because this kind of plot with just these bin averages gets, is, you can find in, 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 in several uh, high profile papers, right? And it's uh, what, the reason why it's, 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 uh, it's not ideal to plot it that way, it, well, it depends on our setup, but if, if you just want to show a trend, of course that's fine, right? But I think the more appropriate way to think about this is to think about this in terms of cross-validation. Let's say we we have this experiment for 4,095 of the 4,096 sequences, right? And we'd like to predict the cut rate for one of the held out hexamers, you know, from something like minor group. There's a lot of combination of, of independent variables, right? So then I would take out that one point, I would use all the other points to construct a linear model, and then I would use the actual minor group for that held out point together with the slope and the intercept you know, of my model to predict the y value, right? And then I would make a plot of the observed y value for that held out data point versus the predicted y value, right, of, of that same point. And the R squared of that plot would be much closer to this value than to that value. Right? So whenever you make, show this kind of trend, uh, and you do kind of coarse graining on the independent variable axis, uh, it's important to, to, to carry this, this variation, you know, and, and, and show it as a box plot rather than just showing the mean per bin, because that gives a misleading uh, picture of what's going on. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip this uh, uh, next slide. But okay, so just to finish this, what you see is that having a narrow minor group where this interaction with the arginines is, is favorable. Um, and then, you know, so you actually want to have a wider minor group where the actual cut gets made, which makes sense, right? You need some room to, 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 to cut. Or maybe there's just a correlation between having a narrow minor group here, and then it kind of comes with a wider group here because of coupling within the DNA molecule, right? And really what matters is what's going on here. We don't really know what, what uh, the reason is for those green correlations. The problem is that, you know, you can only vary DNA shape by varying the sequence, right? So it's, it's hard to s vary DNA shape without var varying the primary sequence. So, you know, it's an understatement. It's very, it's impossible to do that. Um, okay, I was, I could have no, shown you that actually if you look at the DNAs, this cleavage profile predicted along the sequences that come out as bound by EXD Hox from our Selex uh, study that exactly where the interactions with the minor groove occur are highlighted by this profile, which is kind of interesting. So it's <coughs> consistent with what we see there in the crystal structure. Um, so, um, and it also makes some predictions about other places that will be important. So you can, the way EXD Hox interacts with DNA, there's also arginines going into the minor group. So locally the way uh, this N terminal arm of the Hox spirit interacts with the minor group could be similar to how DNAs one interacts with the minor group. Right, so maybe DNAs one is a model for how a part of some larger protein complex interacts with the minor group, and therefore we think that maybe whatever we learn from DNAs one is not just you know property of some enzyme, right? But we think it's a more general for protein DNA. Okay, now I'm going to switch uh, to uh, methylation, right? Because uh, so far we just talked about this variation um, in. Um, in, 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 in DNA shape and, and how it influences uh, this interaction with the minor group. But now, I told you that the, the enzyme that's, that's used in footprinting experiments is, for, is a bovine DNA, it's one, it's from a cow, right? Um, and that same enzyme is used whether you digest yeast genomic DNA or human genomic DNA. And through the ENCODE uh, project, there was other naked DNA digest from, of DNA from, from a, a human cell line SKNSH, your cancer cell line, right? 
And since we control for the composition of the genome, uh, it shouldn't have mattered whether you know we construct our naked DNA hexaver model uh, from yeast genomic DNA DNA data or from human data, right? because we're dealing with all these uh, differences in the genome sequence the right way, we think. Right? But still, if we compare yeast and human hexamer cut rates, uh, every point is a different hexamer. There's much more scatter here than between two replicas of, of the yeast experiment. Right? So we, we were interested in, in understanding this. It was, this was surprising. And what we found, as soon as we started looking at the actual sequence, is that all these points that are kind of off on this separate diagonal have a CPG dinucleotide right downstream of where the cut was made. Right? And CPG is, is what gets methylated in, in mammalian uh, genomes. Yeast doesn't have methylation, right? So that could, if, if methylation of DNA would make a difference for the protein DNA interaction with DNAs1, um, that could potentially explain this. So then, to do this in a more refined way, uh, John's lab actually redid the naked DNA DNAs profile for another cell line, and the cell line we chose for this is the IMR90 fibroblast cell line that was the first one to, to be methylone profiled by Lister at all, right? Uh, at base pair resolution. So this is basically base pair level information about whether a CPG or excitocines are methylated or not in the genome, right? Um, and then in parallel, we had this high density DNAs1 data for the same cell line. Um, and we could use the methylome data to basically partition the genome into two halves, the halves that was where this, the cytosines are fully methylated, and then the, the half or you know, the other part of the genome where the cytosines were not methylated. And then we kind of ignored the part in between. We took the two extremes of this methylation distribution. Right? And then we constructed separately these hexamer tables from the low methylation part of the genome and the high methylation. I'm saying low methylation and not no methylation, right? Because we're, we're getting about 10 reads, as Emily Hodges was showing in, in the beginning. Right? Um, after you do this bisulfide conversion, you're resequencing the, the genome. Right? You, you read every cytosine in the genome about 10 times on average. Right? So not seeing any reads that, that correspond to a, to, a, to a methylated C means it's some kind of, it's unlikely that, you know, it's 50% methylated, right? But it doesn't guarantee that there's no methylation. Maybe if we would have sequenced it more deeply, we would have done it. Um, uh, reads that correspond to methylation. So here now, again, I'm showing in red the subset of hexamers that have a CPG you know, downstream of the cut. Now you see this very clear separate diagonal. And these are all the hexamers that don't contain any CPGs. I see there's about a tenfold difference in the, in the cut rate associated with the CPG methylation. So actually it turns out that uh, you can predict CPG methylation status from DNAs1 uh, profiles this way. And uh, it's uh, the, the way we, uh, we did, not on a single, in principle, if you have super high resolution DNAs1 data, where you have lots of cuts for every uh, position in the genome, you could do it at a single base pair resolution, but, but to get enough counts, we, we had to look in windows of a few KB long. But the, um, the idea is that if you have a, you know, a, a window of, say, about uh, 1 KB, right, and then you have a bunch of cytosines, so this would be a CPG dinucleotide, so two cytosines shifted by one base pair, right, and then Either they could be methylated or not methylated. Right? Often, like fully methylated, both of them fully methylated or not. So, in fully differentiated cells, uh, right, the, both the two cytosines in, in a CPG dinucleotide, so you have a CG here and a CG on the reverse strand, right? In fully methylated, uh, fully differentiated cells, um, almost all the cases, either both cytosines in the CPG are not methylated or they're both methylated, right? So this would be a five metal, methyl cytosine, right? And both this hemimethylated um, uh, uh, case quickly gets changed into a, a fully methylated, like this enzyme called 
one. In stem cells, it's a different story. In stem cells, you can get substantial fraction of your methylated cytosines can occur outside of the CPG context, right? Even, you know, other enabling bases, not necessarily a, a G. Right? So people talk then about, say, for instance, in the CH context, right, where this is not G, right, or, or even the CHH context. If you look at the list of paper, they use this kind of nomenclature. Right, but um, uh, what you could do is, you know, we have our hexamer tables. We know the expected number of cuts, you know, uh, of next to in the CPG uh, at the CPG positions. If we assume that the DNA is unmethylated, right, and that would give us a kind of Poisson lambda, right, the expected number of cuts, assuming that there's no methylation, and we can compare that with the observed number of cuts in the CPG, and then. Combining that with the total number of cuts in this region. So our model would give us some expected fraction of, of all the reads in the, say, 1KB region that would occur next to a, a method in the CPG. And, and based on that, we can build a prediction. And so what you find is that, you know, you predict low methylation, and you show the actual methylation that was measured by biosulfide sequencing. You know, it's not perfect, but at least you get a reasonable <coughs> um, prediction. Right? So, and so the big picture of, of combining these two parts of, of, of what I just talked about is we think there's, you know, that methylation and primary sequence modulate the, the shape of the minor groove uh, just in different ways. But, you know, what DNA senses is through variation of the protein DNA interaction is a variation in minor groove shape, right? And so you can vary the primary sequence just across unmethylated DNA and you get a variation in minor groove shape and the variation in DNA is cleavage. But you can also keep the sequence fixed and just methylate the CPG and that will also change the shape by narrowing the minor groove, enhance the affinity of DNAs1 for the DNA through this interaction with the arginines and then ultimately you know, lead to a higher cleavage rate. And we think again that you know, in DNAs1 it's just one case where this affinity gets, variation gets read out as a variation in cut rate, right? But for other transcription factors, uh, you know, the, they could also um, um, use the upper part of this diagram. They could also respond to methylation uh, via a change in DNA shape. Actually, to, to validate this, Remo's lab did simulations of methylated and unmethylated versions of the same DNA molecule. And you see that indeed in a methylated uh, DNA, there's a narrowing of the minor groove. It kind of confirms this expectation. If you, if you build a model of how variation of minor groove geometry across unmethylated sequences, you know, predicts variation in cut rate, and then you plug in these changes in the, in the shape due to methylation from the computer simulations, you actually get a shift in the delta delta G that corresponds to this about tenfold change in, in cut rate that we saw before. And so uh, it really seems to hold up. Yeah, so, so here, what were we doing? No, I think the, it was really the interaction or the, it was driven by this blue, the blue plots that, plots that were minus three, minus two. Yeah. Sorry, the, uh, this one? No, this oh. back yeah, there. You're finding C plus one plus two are the ones that have that big difference. R right, but so we, we, we see that only when you're cutting right next to this CPG, right, when there's a CPG downstream, um, is there an effect of methylation. Yeah. So in this plot that I'm showing, showing here or, or here, right, we're only considering all the four to the four sequences that have a CPG downstream. We're just varying what's upstream and the, the plus three position. But in the back, the far back one, it seems that the minus one, minus two, is the biggest effect. Am I understanding that wrong? Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, here, well, yeah, minus three, minus two, minus one. Yeah, yeah that's, that's where, the, where the change is in there. Well, that's not clear. That there's, there's, here is just a variation in the minor groove shape with, due to methylation, right? Where the, that leads to a change in the DNA's cut rate. We'd have to model, you know, the, how the cut rate varies in response to variation in, in shape. Right? It doesn't necessarily, from this we don't know where this translates to a change in cut rate. Okay. Right? And to figure that out, we, were, we built this model where we, you know, try to model the variation in cut rate as a function of the shape variation. Okay, so conclusion is that, you know, unexpectedly, right, you have to, if you have DNA's one data, and especially when you look at single base pair resolution, you may want to worry about the fact you have this thousand-fold variation just intrinsically from the properties of DNA's one, right? So you want to make sure that whatever changes you see are not due to this intrinsic effect, but due to, say, chromatin. Um, I have to say that, you know, if you look at how hypersensitivity is mapped by summing up over regions of, say, 100 base pairs or 1,000 base pairs, right, that it's okay because the, this bias changes from base pair to base pair, right? It's, it's very rapidly. So, so it kind of averages out over larger windows. Um, and, and so it doesn't invalidate any of the, uh, you know, the hypersensitivity uh, calling that people have been doing, right? But... Um, but if you, again, if you look at high resolution, it may have an effect. Um, and you know, we, we found this new uh, uh, mechanism of how methylation could, could influence gene expression, right? And which we're actually now exploring as a general uh, mechanism. People are very interested in work on modeling protein DNA interaction. It's, it's now becoming very popular uh, to, to worry about DNA shape. Right? And, and, and to incorporate this, this DNA shape readout in the models, the weight matrix-like model. So don't be surprised that you know, in the next couple of years, all the, you know, with all the high throughput in vitro data, cell eggs and PBM, that you'll see a lot of papers that, that, that start to explicitly worry about this DNA shape. Right? It gives more insight and maybe you'll, you'll get better models. And we're hoping that even it, it could give you know, some insights and real like, tools for making predictions about the the methylation dependence of, of protein DNA interaction. Okay, so this is just a uh, collaborator, so John Stamps lab and, and Remo, uh, who, uh, and uh, Alan, and uh, somewhere in this picture, let's see, oh yeah, top left. 